slides, of course, with just eight minutes per speaker. So uh, we're covering conflicts in uh, Eurasia from, from the, uh, the Hindu Kush to Mount Ararat to Svalbard and other, other parts of the far north. So first off is Pavel Bayev, who's a research professor at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. So over to you, Pavel. Very good. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be a part of this conference. It's probably my 20s, and I love to speak on Arctic matters at great length. Uh, but probably I need to justify first why the Arctic conversation belongs here. After all, there are no wars in the Arctic. Uh, conflicts are entirely manageable. People are not starving and are not protesting in the street. Uh, so why? And the easiest explanation is climate. Everything now is climate related. But I have to say that this particular summer, there is plenty of ice in the Arctic Ocean, much more than the year before or two years before. Um, no scientific model can provide an explanation for that. J uh, just a fact. So I will, won't deal with the climate matters. I will give you three other reasons. Uh, and one is that on the Kola Peninsula, there is a heaviest concentration in the world of nuclear warheads, nuclear reactors, nuclear waste, and the risks. And the second reason is that in the Arctic, uh, Arctic is the only theater where Russia has built for itself a position of power, uh, military superiority, uh, not used at, uh, uh, so far, but at least it's there. And the third reason is that at this moment, this week's in Europe, there is very sharp gas supply crisis and the price is going through the roof and most uh, large part of the gas for Europe comes from the Russian Arctic. So I think there are three good reasons and there is another one. China is interested. And for what I know, this reason in Washington DC trumps just about everything else. And it's for that reason that the former US president, who better not be named, tried to buy Greenland. I'm pretty sure Greenland is not for sale. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that climate change will continue fast, uh, despite our best efforts, or without our best efforts. Uh, but uh, I am not sure at all how Russia will behave in the Arctic. And this uncertainty cannot be reduced. I see very clearly that Russian Arctic policy has two uh, distinct separate tracks. One track is going for development and cooperation, and the second track is on military buildup and confrontation. And there are interesting developments on both tracks presently, which and the issues on both tracks, which makes them move further apart. So it is increasingly difficult for Moscow to have it both ways. Uh, it's always the uh, uh, choice of Russian politics to have it this way, but it's, it's becoming very difficult. And the issues on the track of uh, cooperation and development, so to say, are now uh, made more interested by the fact that Russia has assumed in May chairmanship in the Arctic Council, an organization bringing together the uh, Arctic states uh, for two years. And the Russian leadership really wants to make this chairmanship a success, not just Russian diplomacy. Well, it's, it's mostly a diplomatic show, but Putin, President Putin has his own interest in the Arctic and he really wants to shine on this, on this arena. As we see, he's not very comfortable even on such settings as Shanghai or, or uh, BRICS for that matter. He makes very brief appearances on this, uh, on this events and it's China which is stealing the show. And for Russia, it is very difficult to pretend it's a great power, for instance, in Asia Pacific by any measure, by any uh, measuring stick. Well, Russia can't qualify. In the Arctic, it's a different matter. Russia really feels great power there. And so it's, it's really a position to enjoy. And I hope uh, it will be possible for Russia to make a success out of this chairmanship. The problem on this track of development and cooperation is that with all the uh, interest in economic prospects, it's entirely profitless. Uh, Russia cannot find a way to make all these investments profitable. There are some profits uh, for 
particular corporations, sometimes for Gazprom, sometimes for Novatech. But as far as Russian state budget is concerned, most of the Arctic developments need a lot of investment and tax breaks. And that's the only way how they can work, particularly on the uh, Yamal Peninsula. So yes, it's interesting and there are attractive options, but uh, uh, as far as economic sense is concerned, it's very difficult to find much. On the military track, it's a even more complicated picture. Yes, there is a position of military strength and uh, every year on, on every parade on the Red Square, you can see new weapon systems painted in the Arctic camouflage not in the desert camouflage, not like anywhere else, particularly in the Arctic camouflage. There is continuing process of building up this uh, grouping of re-equipping re it. Uh, and it's not just camouflage, so it's not just the paint. A lot of weapon systems are kind of tested for the harsh Ar Arctic conditions. A lot of new uh, investments are going on there. Uh, but the issue is that Russia now has plenty of other demands for its military might. And the most recent one is in Central Asia on the border with Afghanistan, where Russia needs to build up its military uh, presence. At the moment, at the Khan Air Base, you have kind of four very old planes. In Tajikistan, you have five and a couple of helicopters. That's not really enough. Uh, there are demands in the Caucasus. Alexander will be probably uh, talking about it later. There are certainly a lot of demands. We have seen them with the Zapad exercises. Uh, two weeks ago, there are demands in Syria. So if you want to, for instance, add to your uh, military presence in Central Asia, and the demand there is pretty pressing, you cannot just add, you also need to deduct from somewhere where the threats are low, where the risks are uh, manageable. And the first thing which comes to mind is the Arctic. So the military build up in the market because becomes less and less sustainable simply because Russia cannot build sufficient numbers uh, in its military force. Uh, you know, demographic just isn't there. And over the course of this epidemic, demographic situation in Russia has even worsened. We might even see that the excess mortality for that matter over, the, over this course is about as um, big as the whole strength of the armed forces. Um, you know, that just to give you a scale. So it is difficult to enjoy the position of strength in the Arctic when you have so many other demands uh, on, your, on your military uh, power projection. And the new bases in the Arctic you know, with their main profile and their defense most of the year are just sitting there doing nothing, which isn't a very uh, interesting uh, occupation. So there are issues on this, on this track as well. And uh, where can the choice will go, that is a big question. And probably one uh, indication we might have is the forthcoming, probably forthcoming new test of the Burevesnik uh, cruise missile, which is a very bad design, honestly. Uh, it, just, it is nuclear propelled. So every time you stage a test, it means you need to crash land the nuclear reactor. There is no safe way of doing it. But there were already two bad tests in, seven, in the year 17 and the year 19 with a uh, second one with uh, human casualties. Uh, so if that test is staged, I think it's very, very clear indicator that all oh, Russian uh, Arctic chairmanship is all very good, but the, the real choice is there. And then there is China, certainly. China is not particularly interested in Russian military activities in the Arctic. It doesn't want the region being militarized. It also is not even particularly interested in Russia asserting its sovereignty. It's much more interested in the Arctic being a sort of global common. So there are issues there with China and Russia. And I think for the United States, for the West in general, it is a reasonable choice to try to help Russia to make its Arctic chairmanship a success because this is probably the best way uh, to um, tell Russia to indicate that militarization isn't really profitable. Uh, there are some other issues, but at least just some prestige is there to be had uh, and the chance is not to be missed. I will stop here. That's my seven minutes. Great, thank you, Pavel, and some grounds for optimism there. And uh, I would like to encourage the audience to post questions in the chat uh, that might speed things up. We will hold off the general discussion until all four presentations and the 
commentator have gone forward. So now the floor is over to Alexander Iskandarian, who is the director of the Caucasus Institute in Yerevan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, can you listen to me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, glad, glad to be here and, and, and see all of you uh, online, but, 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 uh, uh, but glad to see you. Okay, uh, the main uh, argument I want to make today and have made in my memo uh, is that the Second Karabakh War shouldn't be interpreted in the context of, uh, of the South Caucasus alone. While it did change uh, the entire format of the South Caucasus region, I believe that it has also revealed a wider trend that extends beyond our region to the post-Soviet space uh, at the very least. Of course, I'm not trying to say that the South Caucasus is uh, the beachhead uh, for, for a new world order. However, things that happened here can reflect larger trends. One of the uh, things this war has shown is that the tools and mechanisms invented in the old political system no longer work. This is true both for formal institutions such as the OSC and the for informal ones such as normative capacity of great powers. It is true that Mr. Ali, the president of Azerbaijan, chose the ideal timing for this war. Brexit and overall management crisis in European Union, Turkey's behavior in the NATO and Erdogan policies in general, elections in the United States, the crisis in Belarus, the crisis in Ukraine, problems of Russia around North Stream 2, the COVID pandemic uh, with all its political consequences. Again, this background, the South Caucasus wasn't exactly the biggest uh, concern uh, of the world powers. I will try to show, however, that the good timing uh, accentuated the trend, but didn't produce it. Global actors have been paying less and less attention to my region, to the South Caucasus, for quite a while now. Uh, this isn't just true for our region. It also holds for Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, the last events there are, and the world's reaction to them show that unipolar normative world is coming to an end, even as an intention. The trend points away from unipolarity and even bipolarity, away from normative politics uh, in the direction of regionalism and geopolitics. Wherever we see external players become involved in a local conflict, those aren't global powers, but regional ones. Actors will stakes in the particular region. Their stakes aren't about the liberal order, but about geopolitical interest in a 19th century spirit. Along the perimeter of the former USSR, Russia isn't competing really with global powers, but with regional, regional ones. It's Poland in the Northwest, Romania in the Southwest, Turkey in the South Caucasus, and China in Central Asia. While China is a global power, sure. In Central Asia, it operated as a regional power, I would say. One can argue that uh, if and when uh, or when Afghanistan succeeds in state building, it can start to have a say in developments in Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Kyrgyzstan, acting on its own or alongside Pakistan. The specific forms on influence can vary, but the trend is there. In the case of Nagorno-Karabakh and the South Caucasus in general, this new trend changed the entire layout. Securitization of our region means that European influence will go down while that of Russia and Turkey will go up. Our region is becoming in structural terms similar to Syria, a country, the situation in which is 
uh, in my view, best described by the diplomatic phrase used uh, for it in Russia, uh, competitive collaboration, конкурентное сотрудничество in Russian, between Russia and Turkey. Or one could argue that the South Caucasus is, in stark contrast to Syria, a member of European bodies and programs, including OSC, Council of Europe, uh, I don't know, and, and Eastern Partnership. My point is that uh, this no longer matters because those organizations were set up in a different world uh, and are changing their roles and parameters in the new one. It is hard to say how global this trend may turn out to be. At least in post-Soviet countries, it is uh, vividly manifest. Since the trend logically follows the disintegration of the USSR, and with it of the bipolar world uh, order, it's logical that it would be especially pronounced in the former Soviet space. My hypothesis is that the trend extends beyond this space. However, it needs uh, further research. Maybe I uh, will stop here. Okay, thank you, Alexander. And we're moving ahead right on time to Irina Kobrinskaya from the Primakov National Research Institute of World Economy and International Relations in Moscow. And uh, the floor is yours, Irina. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Yes, we can hear. Thank you. Uh, well, glad to see you all though, on the screen. Uh, well, uh, my the point of, of my topic, the, my topic of my memo is uh, as old as <laughs> practically two centuries, because the dilemma uh, where Russia should go to the east or to the west is Russia, Europe or Asia has at least two centuries um, yeah, behind it. Uh, still, the uh, 21st century uh, made this dilemma sharply relevant in a new global context defined by a number of long-term trends. Uh, I enumerate these trends in my memo and first and most significant is the unprecedented strengthening of China and clearly articulated ambitions for leadership in the region and in the world. Second uh, trend is caused mostly by the first, and this is the refocusing of the global strategy of the West to Asia. It started, uh, it was started by Obama, and I would say the Chinese factor that underlies and determines a significant part of trade and economic and technological initiatives and actions on the of the West as a whole in all regions of the world, from Arctic, as Pavel said, to Southern Africa. Equally, the non-participation of China in uh, the treaties, arms control treaties, uh, was the reason to a great extent of pretext for the dismantling of most of the basic treaties in this area, the initiative of the United States. Third, consolidation of the West, the rapprochement of the EU with the US in the formation of a common strategy towards China. As the latest news show, and I mean the establishment of the AUKUS AUKUS, this consolidation is in the state of flux. Its frames will likely change again with the purpose of being most effective in deterrence of China. The consequences of pandemic also exacerbated distrust and also new in this uh, whole uh, context is the rivalry of Europe uh, and the West of the whole with China. Uh, uh, this is the revival of its ideological component uh, after 30 years. Um, the themes of democracy and human rights will, which will rather would only strengthen. Finally, the most recent important factor in the Western Chinese relations became Afghanistan, where China's role in the region is significantly increasing. Geoeconomical, geopolitical, and ideological rival, rivalry, a confrontation between West Europe and China is the reality that Russia will have to deal with in the foreseeable and long future. 
At the same time, for Russia of special importance is not the position of the West as a whole, but of Europe, the European Union and its member countries. Because first, the Entente Cordiale between Europe and US, from my point of view, is rather problematic. Yes, it is standing uh, and it is strengthened by the ch factor of China. Uh, still, the EU uh, position towards China remains more nuanced and based on their own uh, real trade, economic and political interests. Second, both the trade and economic and security agenda of Russia and Europe in relations with China uh, have more points of contact and common concerns uh, than Russian and American position because the global context has changed, but not the geography. Greater Europe, greater Eurasia remain relevant geoeconomic and geopolitical concepts. Finally, the third Russia with all the known deviations from the classical democratic models of development remains a part of Judeo-Christian world in civilization and historical terms and a European country with established centuries old cult cultural ties and traditions with the European identity. In this emerging new global context, the answers to this classic Russian question where to go uh, can partly be provided by the objective data on trade economic relations. And it is sufficient to say that Russia is the fifth largest trade partner for the EU and for China, Russia is on the 11th place. And the foreign direct investments from Europe in Russia amounted to $350 billion in 2019, while of China only $13 billion. I will stop here. But anyway, Russia's dependence on importance uh, of imports of machinery and technological equipment from China uh, and the EU is high, and experts say it will increase. And in the conditions of fierce competition in this sphere, uh, for Russia, the development of a strategy uh, that allows preserving sovereignty and freedom of choice in this area is strategically important. Technological dependence on China is assessed by Russian expert, experts as a negative scenario. Uh, now, um, as I mentioned, Russia remains uh, a European country. What do Russian society and elites think? Well, uh, according to polls conducted by the liberal, and I stress it, liberal Levada Center in 2019-2021, the positive attitude towards the EU well, it decreased gradually, uh, but still uh, in 21, 45% of respondents had a good attitude to the EU. Uh, well, uh, young people uh, said, well, 62% were positive. The attitude of Russians to China improved dramatically in 2014 against the background uh, of the conflict between Russia and the West, and, and uh, it is now 75% positive. Still, uh, well, uh, the sociological research shows that Russia is gradually moving away from Europe. And in 2008, 52% considered Russia a European country, while in two, uh, 2019, only 37%. Still, for young people, uh, Europe remains an important reference point in terms of opportunities and desired well-being. Uh, but uh, most evident and vivid are the moods of the business and political elite. Their position has a concrete material expression and does not need comments. Upper middle and wealthy Russians keep their savings, buy real estate and invest in Europe, not in China. Uh, well, uh, regarding geopolitics, it is changing, I would say, because uh, uh, the new stance of NATO and the United States uh, in dealing with the crisis um, in the world makes strengthening of cooperation between Russia and the EU more needed. China has long been Russia's partner in ensuring security in Central Asia and now in Northeast Asia. Still, Moscow is clearly aware that in its policy in the region, Beijing is guided by its own interests, uh, which not always coincide with Russian ones. Uh, Russia's relations with China are defined as strategic partnership. The Kremlin is in no hurry to raise them to the level of an alliance, according to Peskov. He 
this is the way he answered this question. Well, uh, he said that strategic partnership is enough. Also at the official and expert level, China says that there is no need for an alliance. The parties do not want to take an excessive to take on excessive obligations and they do not need additional restrictions. Sovereign independent foreign policy remains the cornerstone of philosophy of both regimes in China and in Russia. And meanwhile, Russia's relations with the EU now seem to reach a low plateau after crisis with the launch of the Northern Stream 2. In the nearest future, um, much will depend on the elections in Germany. And it seems to me that despite all its problems, the EU will, will remain together in the foreseeable future and Franco German tandem open to pragmatic cooperation with Russia will play a key role in it. And Russia uh, striving to preserve its geopolitical and geoeconomic sovereignty needs to take advantage of this. Thank you. Great, thank you. And we move on to our final presenter in this panel, which is uh, Elizabeth Wishnick, Professor of Political Science at Montclair State University and a Senior Research Fellow at the uh, Weatherhead Institute for East Asian Studies at Columbia University. So, uh, Professor Wishnick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you virtually. Um, so we've heard a lot about China on this panel already, China in the Arctic, China in the Caucasus, uh, China, um, Russia and Europe. And uh, now I'm going to talk to you about China, Russia and Afghanistan. And um, I'm reacting to two commonly seen perspectives on, uh, on China and Russia in the aftermath of the collapse of the Afghan gov government and the uh, return of the Taliban. And that is that uh, Russia and China are coordinating their Afghanistan policies and that they are the beneficiaries of this turn of events. And so I'm going to argue that this uh, is not the case. Um, both uh, Russia and China, while they complained about uh, the presence of NATO forces uh, near their borders, um, we're actually benefiting from the security of these forces and now are mainly uh, focusing on managing the threats uh, created by uh, the collapse of the Afghan government. Um, so China is often mentioned as being uh, well placed to reap the benefits of a trillion dollars in uh, potential rare earths in Afghanistan and other resources, but it has had projects in Afghanistan uh, for more than a decade and has been unable to move forward with them because of the security situation. Um, and actually, last year, China only invested $4 million in Afghanistan, which was 3% of the amount it invested in Pakistan. So uh, China has played a, a relatively minor role in terms of uh, providing aid uh, to Afghanistan compared to other countries. Um, of course, for China, the, the main concern is, is Xinjiang, um, its western uh, province. And uh, China has said that it is its bottom line that Afghanistan would not become a haven for terrorists. And that is really the the uh, main purpose of its engagement with the Taliban is to present to prevent that outcome. Um, but if we see how China has been doing in its much greater investments in Pakistan, which has been a long standing ally, um, there's not a lot of reason for optimism that a newly forged um, acquaintance with the Taliban would would uh, provide security guarantees for China when the Pakistani government has been unable to do so um, in Pakistan and Chinese investors and uh, nationals have found themselves increasingly the target of, of attacks. Uh, so like China, Russia faces many threats from instability in Afghanistan that could spill over into uh, Central Asia as well as into Russia's own Muslim regions. And uh, for that reason, uh, Russia has been beefing up its security cooperation 
with uh, Central Asian states, uh, as has China also on its own accord. Uh, Russia is also concerned about narcotics trafficking, which has always been a, a big problem uh, from Afghanistan, and neither country has has uh, accepted any refugees from Afghanistan. Um, so they each have, uh, they each face a very threatening environment from this turn of events. Um, but I would argue that despite the rhetoric we have heard about uh, the two coordinating their policies, synchronizing their clocks and so on, I would say that there are, that there are reasons to believe that they are uh, not pursuing identical policies. They might have some similar moves, but I, I would say they're for different reasons. Uh, for example, we saw Russia and China abstain on the US-sponsored resolution in the UN on Afghanistan about the safe passage of, of uh, nationals out, out of Afghanistan. Uh, we saw both Russia and China engaging in talks with the Taliban. Uh, so they do have some similar moves, but I would say that there are three issues that point to differences between the two. Uh, one is India. Um, I think they have very different attitudes towards the potential participation of India in, in this uh, Taliban uh, governed Afghanistan. Of course, India, a traditional partner of Russia's, and we've seen Russia lately try to simultaneously engage with both uh, Pakistan and India, and recently agreeing with India to intelligence sharing on terrorism and drug trafficking uh, connected to Afghanistan. For China, it's just great that India is being marginalized in this new environment. And recently, some Chinese analysts were quoted in the admittedly nationalistic tabloid uh, Global Times that uh, India should not become poison for SCO cooperation uh, on the Afghan issue. Uh, so for China, it's a it, it, the turn of events that marginalize India because of its its unwillingness to engage with the Taliban ha, has uh, had some positives for Russia. Uh, they would like to see India more involved. Uh, the second issue has to do with the recognition of the Taliban. Russia continues to label it a terrorist organization, though it ha has had contacts uh, with the group. Uh, but uh, Russian officials refuse to attend. Uh, the September 6th ceremony that the Taliban organized for their to commemorate their uh, coming to power. Um, and uh, Chinese, uh, there was a Chinese statement later, we understand Russia's position, but they never said what their own position was. And the ceremony ended up being canceled. Anyway, um, China seems to be more willing than most other parties to work with the Taliban, probably because of their great uh, sec security concerns with respect to Xinjiang. They've offered a small amount of aid, $31 million. Um, but I would argue this is going to have a negative impact on China's already declining soft power in Central Asia, where there is much less enthusiasm for engaging with the Taliban. Um, recently, the SCO summit uh, was held in Tajikistan. Xi Jinping did not attend. Uh, Tajikistan has been most vocal about uh, not uh, not recognizing the Taliban. Um, and uh, Putin at the last minute didn't come either, ostensibly because he was quarantining from COVID. Uh, but a uh, Tajikistan uh, media analysis suggested that differences between Russia and China on the issue of the Taliban uh, led to both leaders staying home um, instead of attending this, this important meeting. Um, so I would say that the, the issue of the Taliban uh, and how to, to engage with it is a difference between the two. Um, and finally, providing security in Central Asia. Uh, uh, Pavel talked about how Russia is going to have to uh, increasingly redirect some resources there. China is also interested in security in Central Asia, uh, having its own exercises uh, with Tajikistan, uh, uh, Russia has been doing the same with it, with its Central Asian partners. Um, but how will Russia react to a greater security role by China in Central Asia, if China indeed 
seeks to pursue this. It always, already has a small contingent of forces, order forces in Tajikistan and has some private security um, uh, companies working in the region. Um, Russia, uh, I think, has has typically been the security guarantor um, in in this region, and I think would like to remain that. Uh, China would like more multilateral cover for its security activities, uh, but uh, Russia has said that the SEO will not become a military bloc, and has uh, said that it is uh, not timely for Afghanistan to join this organization. Uh, so I think that that is going to be interesting to see how Russia and China navigate the security environment and how each reacts to the moves by the other to to stabilize the situation. And, and finally, I'll just conclude with uh, one uh, one issue to watch is that both Russia and China find themselves on the UN Credentials Committee, which has the uh, interesting task of deciding what to do about the Taliban's request uh, to uh, address the General Assembly. Uh, are they going to uh, be in agreement about what to do? Or um, I'm, I'm very curious what's going to happen in that committee. Uh, so I'll, I'll close here. I think uh, that uh, we shouldn't assume so much coordination between Russia and China, despite the 20th anniversary of their partnership. They each face their complicated geopolitical complications, um, their calculations as a result of the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, they have some similar concerns, but uh, their interests are far from identical. And I think how they manage this new situation will tell us a lot about the future of the Sino-Russian partnership. So thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that very comprehensive overview. And to comment on the four uh, papers that we've just heard, we have Angela Stent, who is director of the Center for Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies and professor of government and foreign service at Georgetown University. She's also a co-chair of the Hewitt Forum on Post-Soviet Affairs at the Brookings Institution. And uh, there will be opportunity for the audience to ask questions after Dr. Stent's comments. Uh, and also you can put them in the chat facility. So over to you, Dr. Stent. Thank you very much. Um, this is the first time I've ever spoken on a Ponal's panel. I'm very glad to be doing this. I thought the papers were all terrific. I really don't disagree with anything. So I'll just make a few points on some of them and then look forward to your discussion. And I'm gonna start with Elizabeth's excellent paper on Afghanistan. Um, I agree with you completely um, that uh, the coming to power of the Taliban in Afghanistan is not necessarily a net gain for either Russia or China. Obviously you had this Russian rhetoric in the first few days after the fall uh, of the previous government um, saying that America was finished as a great power uh, telling America's allies that it couldn't be relied on anymore, um, this kind of general schadenfreude. Um, but that has really more or less tapered off. We don't hear that much about it anymore. Um, and the reality is that the Russians wanted the United States and NATO to remain in Afghanistan with a minimal military force to stabilize the country and to prevent the kind of dangers that Russia now faces in the aftermath um, of the fall of Kabul. I also agree with Elizabeth that all of these predictions that the Chinese are going to make billions from exploiting all the rare uh, minerals, rare earths, things like that in Afghanistan are vastly exaggerated. Um, and that for the Chinese too, the return to power of the Taliban um, is a potential threat, both to the neighborhood and of course to the situation uh, within their own country. Um, as other terrorist groups now uh, come back to Afghanistan and regroup there. Um, so I would say for Russia, and I'm gonna focus more on that, uh, the return of the Taliban represents some opportunities, but also quite a few dangers. Um, for the Russians are very concerned about um, the potential for instability, both in Central Asia and in the Russian Federation itself, uh, from the rise, of, you know, which may well happen, of um, greater terrorist groups in the area. 
um, and in the in the um, past, they of course had their own citizens join uh, these extremist groups, um, both in Afghanistan, obviously in other parts of the region, um, and that really could come back to, to haunt them. So that is a great concern for them, hence their ambivalence about whether they recognize the Taliban, even though, as Elizabeth points out, they've been dealing with them for a number of years. Now, there are also some opportunities here, however, with uh, the departure of the US and NATO. Um, I think Russia could be set to increase its influence in Central Asia, this goes uh, against some of the things that, that some of the rest of you have written, but I think um, the Central Asian states themselves have to face uh, their own difficulties of dealing with greater instability there. And some of the more reluctant ones like uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan might have to rethink um, their willingness to participate in Russian run organizations, particularly the CSTO, and whether that could maybe one day become a somewhat more effective organization, although I'm a little bit skeptical of that. And then I think the final point really is paradoxically, um, this also provides greater opportunities, despite everything else that's going on, for US-Russian cooperation on counterterrorism. Um, after all, it worked well in the fall of 2001, the US and NATO wouldn't have accomplished what they did without um, some of the assistance they got from Russia, of course, with its decades own uh, experience of fighting in Afghanistan. And you see now uh, Russian officials talking uh, very publicly about the need for greater counterterrorism cooperation with the United States. You've had General Milley with, meet with General Gerasimov uh, recently last week and talk about counterterrorism. So this is something that did work. Uh, it's difficult, it's awkward for the US and Russia, but it has worked and it can work in the future. And so in a strange way, when we talk about great power competition in this region, um, you could also see new, possibly great power cooperation in this area um, of counterterrorism in Afghanistan. Um, the next paper I will turn to is Irina's. Uh, Irina, you raised, of course, the eternal question at the beginning there, is Russia part of Europe? Is it part of Asia? We know Russia is not fully European, it's not fully Asian, but it's more European than it is Asian. And of course, the Chinese, for instance, do not regard Russians as Asians. But of course, you're quite right, this debate will go on for at least another 200 years, if not more. Um, I agree with uh, most of what you say in the paper. I think maybe uh, when you wrote it, you were a little bit too optimistic about the degree to which the United States has now uh, improved and, and renewed and repaired its ties with its allies in Europe. We had that initial phase in June uh, when President Biden was there and met with all the allies. They agreed to, to work together. There was a sense of this was so, uh, you know, a wonderful, refreshing change after the past four years. But if you look at what's happened in the past few weeks, indeed, and you mentioned some of that, um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan without real consultation with our allies, and they have to face the very difficult, catastrophic consequences of that. Um, the push to get Europe to agree with the US to, to focus on um, an adversarial relationship with China, on fighting China, and then this AUKUS, um, alliance at the last week, um, and obviously France's great disgruntlement with and other European allies wondering about what this means, uh, about their, how much they can rely on the US, plus a concern that is always there that given the polarization of US society, you could certainly in 2024 have a return to the White House of either President Trump himself or of a Trump like um, figure. Uh, and so I think the, the, the consolidation of the Western alliances, I, I wouldn't say that that's really very much an accomplished um, uh, fact at the moment. And I really am very skeptical, and I think you point to that too, that most of Europe is gonna be willing to go along with the United States in this anti-China policy. And we really don't know the contours of that yet. We, we've heard a lot of rhetoric. Um, and my final point on your paper has to do with the German election. Mm -hmm. I do think that whoever wins or whatever kind of coalition comes to power after Sunday, um, I don't think that the German policy will change very much towards Russia. The Ostpolitik is a 50-year-old 
a policy where there's great consensus. And even though the leader of the Greens, obviously, she is much, and the Green Party has been much more critical of Russia. If the Greens are in a coalition uh, government, they will be restrained um, in what they could do were they to try and pursue a different policy. And so I think what you saw with Chancellor Merkel's final visit uh, as chancellor to President Putin on display a couple of weeks ago, um, will that just uh, will be the continuity in German policy going forward? The question is, will Germany remain the leader in Europe um, in dealing with Russia? Uh, and now let me come to Alexander's paper, again, where I agree very much with, with what you wrote in the paper, uh, that Turkey, of course, has been the winner in this war. Uh, and for the first time since the Soviet collapse, uh, Russia has to have another foreign power in the South Caucasus uh, with a role to play there. Uh, something that I think that, you know, a few years ago, it really would have sought uh, to prevent. Um, it is also true that without Turkish and also Israeli help, uh, the Azeris would not have won uh, the war in the way that they won it. Um, and, um, and this, and I think as you yourself point out, the previous ambivalence of the Kremlin about the Pashinyan government and what it represented, um, sort of um, it, it, that that was a factor um, in that in that the outcome of the war too. Um, I do see the South Caucasus, as you say, as a zone now of greater Russian-Turkish competition than it was before. Of course, you have the greater the Russian-Turkish competition uh, in Syria. You have it in Libya, and increasingly, of course very diametrically opposed views of Ukraine. <laughs> Erdogan uh, going to Ukraine, uh, saying that Crimea is Ukrainian, uh, Turkey supplying drones uh, uh, to the Ukrainian government. Um, and um, on the other hand, of course, um, the Turks appreciate uh, the Russian support for President Erdogan's version of what happened during the coup. Um, and the Russians, of course, have never criticized him for anything that happens domestically in Turkey. Um, plus uh, the fact that the Turks have purchased the S-400s from the Russians. So it's a mixed relationship, but I agree with you that as the result of the outcome of the war in Nagorno-Karabakh, um, the, the nature of that relationship with the competition has somewhat um, shifted. Um, and then um, I, um, I think, you make a very good point, which you, uh, of course, elaborated on in your remarks uh, just now. Um, the increasing deglobalization of a number of these conflicts um, in Eurasia and the greater regionalization of these conflicts. I think that's true in the South Caucasus. I think it's going to be true in the aftermath of uh, what happened in Afghanistan. Um, and I think the Biden administration, to come back to the US, is in general less likely to pay attention to this part of the world, just because of all of the other things it has to deal with, uh, both domestically and in terms of foreign policy, and that the regional actors uh, that you have mentioned, uh, including Turkey, Iran, and other ones, uh, will become much more important there. Um, I, I think my final point <clears throat> is that, <clears throat> whereas I do agree with you that there is a shift now um, in Russia's relations with its neighbors, I don't necessarily think that it's losing influence in general um, in what people used to call <laughs> the post-Soviet space. I think it depends. Um, its relationship with um, you know, most of its Western neighbors, certainly it's lost influence, with the great exception of Belarus, where of course it's consolidating its hold. Um, it probably is losing influence, as you point out, in the South Caucasus. But again, I come back to the the point about Afghanistan that I was making before, I think it's possible that in Central Asia, it could maybe increase its influence there. Um, my final thought on all of this is the Biden administration has this democracy agenda. Uh, there's going to be a summit of democracies that's going to happen here in, in December. And I wonder how that is going to play out uh, against on the one, that on the one hand, on the other hand, to the extent that it is involved in this part of the world, a more pragmatic relationship uh, with countries, including the South Caucasus. Uh, and then I'll finally turn to Havel's paper. Um, I agree very much with your opening salvo, uh, uh, Pavel. It's highly questionable whether a stable and predictable relationship between the US and Russia is gonna be possible. 
uh, the Biden administration would like to park the relationship with Russia, to put it aside and focus on uh, the rivalry and competition with uh, China. Uh, but I think that's going to prove extremely difficult uh, going forward. Um, I think the Arctic, as you very well show, is an area where for the US and Russia both compete and cooperate. Uh, that's quite clear. I think the mix may change going forward. Um, but of course, the Biden administration is has singled out the Arctic as an area in its more general climate agenda where the US and Russia um, should work together, can work together. Um, like you, I'm somewhat skeptical. I think this idea of this greater cooperation with Russia on climate issues is aspirational. I think it remains to be seen whether it's actually possible, but certainly at the moment, this is an area where they will try to work together. But of course, in the as you show very well, in the military and geopolitical sense, um, uh, this is very much an area of competition uh, between the United States and the other Arctic states and Russia. Um, and I think this is just going to intensify uh, Russia has, as you say, taken over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Russia is engaging in a military buildup there. It's got all of the, the, these new um, icebreakers there as well. Um, and and as, the, as more sea lanes open up, this competition is going to intensify. You may well be correct that maybe Russia doesn't have the military hardware that it needs or all of it in order to uh, fully militarize uh, this area. But it certainly is uh, an element that the US is very concerned about. And finally, the US is developing more of an Arctic strategy than it's had for a long time. It's really having to play catch up there. Russia sees itself as the rightful dominant power in the area, in the area of the Arctic, um, and wants other countries in some ways to recognize its leadership there. Um, so I, um, you know, I think it's difficult to uh, predict exactly how much this mix of cooperation and competition between the two, the US and Russia uh, in the Arctic will uh, develop. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, I would just agree with all the rest of your points and I will stop there. Great, thank you so much. So we do have uh, 20 minutes or so for questions. So I would encourage people to uh, put up their, their yellow hand and, uh, I have a question from Mikhail Alexeyev that was in the chat room and I'll invite Mikhail to voice it in person and then we'll follow with David Abramson and uh, Dmitry Gorenberg. Go ahead, Mikhail. If the powers that be can, can, uh, can unmute you. Try. No good. Okay, well, pa Pavel, hopefully you, you can see his question in the chat room. So maybe you could uh, uh, answer it anyway, Pavel, if you can. Uh, uh, I got unmuted. Uh, great. Okay, go ahead, Mikhail. Because uh, I only posted it to you, Peter. So Pavel ah, could see it on chat. Ah. So um, is Russia's investment in building military capabilities in the Arctic? really as counterproductive um, or protect cost wasteful as you suggest, I believe in your paper in the presentation, we're talking about those subs and air defenses and uh, even Burivesnik. Could it reflect perhaps a longer term calculation that such capabilities would enable Russia to ascertain, solidify and execute its territorial claims that it had been advancing for a long time? You know, they're claiming about a third, I believe, of the whole Arctic between Mendeleev and Lomonosov ridges. And also hasn't successful annexation of Crimea and propping up the Assad regime signaled to Moscow that milit military power is pivotal and pays off in international relations. And so, you know, it would be hard to convince the Kremlin not to do it. Okay, Pavel, go ahead. I, I agree that uh, for, uh, for the Kremlin, military force is an instrument of choice in foreign policy. And we have seen it many times in different uh, theaters. And the, indeed, in the Arctic, there are opportunities for doing it. What I see that 
Russia has not found so far any useful way to apply this instrument in the Arctic. Every demonstration they have doesn't really impress the neighbors into kind of greater respect of Russia's interests. The territorial claim is in the UN uh, uh, committee, uh, UN committee on continental shelf, and hardly military power will uh, impress the scientists who are going to. Uh, evaluating the, um, the data there. Uh, there are certainly always temptations to make another demonstration of your military capabilities, like, for instance, surfacing the three nuclear submarines at the Northern Pole. You start looking at it closely, you know, it's a pretty cheap thing, in a sense. They are very valuable assets. You don't need to bring them all three together you want to spread them as far as possible you know that's kind of your basic strategic strategic point so i don't see for russia in the arctic any useful way to use um, any feasible uh, possibility to use the uh, military strengths it has there while there are demands are growing from other theaters and so Russia has to make some choices where it really needs to apply its military instruments. And I think the new demand coming from Central Asia might be very important in this regard. Okay, thanks. So uh, next up is David Abramson. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, I have a somewhat provocative question. Uh, it's a sort of double question. There's been a lot of discussion about the question of whether Russia and China will become allies and how that would pose a huge threat to the U.S. and West and others. What do you think is the likelihood that AUKUS or an expansion of it would lead to their forming an alliance prematurely before they're ready to, forcing them into making an uncomfortable, from their perspectives, decision? And the other part is, would pushing them towards choosing an alliance or reassessment of their relations with the West be a bad thing for U.S. Uh, interests, assuming that neither really wants to do that because it would limit their independent action more than enhance their collective power. Big assumption, but. Is that a question for Pavel Bayev or Elizabeth Wishnik or? Uh, it's for Elizabeth, but also uh, anyone who wants to answer uh, even more from a Russian, other uh, Russian perspective. Okay, maybe give Elizabeth the first uh, stab at it then. Okay, uh, thanks for those tough questions. Uh, I'm not one who thinks that uh, there is going to be a Russia-China alliance. I think uh, they talk about it um, and the talk itself uh, serves a deterrent purpose. So there's actually no need to create an alliance, which as you say would would have lim limiting uh, qualities. But I think that even without an alliance, uh, their strategic partnership sets limits on their independent action. For example, for Russia in, the, in, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, or uh, with respect to India, and uh, China with respect to Ukraine, and so on. So I don't know that having an alliance uh, would would really make that much of a difference but but in any case neither country really has said that they aim for this alliance and china's china's rhetoric is that the relationship is more than an alliance <laughs> and so going and the recent agreement says that the partnership it has is is not just a state to state relationship um, and it's not a cold war uh, relic and I think uh, this highlights the domestic drivers for both countries that bring them together. And um, actually, I think the geopolitics are what drives them apart uh, in some ways. So let the other panelists uh, take a stab at this. So I would also add that there's a, there's a very interesting article in, in the Washington Quarterly just published by Alexander Lukin that looks at the Russia-China relationship. Um, I will be giving all four panelists the chance at the end to respond to Dr. Sten's comments, but for the time being, I'd like to go ahead and maybe get the last two questions from Dmitry Gorenberg and Robert Freeman. So uh, go ahead, uh, Dima. Uh, great, thank you. This is a question for Pavel. Um, and 
early, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, the economic uh, 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 development of, of the Arctic is uh, unsustainable and unprofitable for, for Russia. Uh, and I was just uh, wondering if there's maybe a different way of looking at it, which is that the subsidies that I mean, we tend to think, OK, Russia is a kind of a unitary actor. But if we think about the Russian leadership, some of whom have investments incorporate or, or, or you know, the, 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 the inner circle uh, who have uh, positions in corporations that profit from these subsidies. Right. It could be that this is actually beneficial to parts of the leadership that they're in, it's essentially taking money out of the state from these subsidies and and then uh, turning them into into uh, profits for their corporations and, and so forth. And so from that point, if you think about it in that perspective, I'm just looking for what you think about the, the possibility of this is actually something that uh, is seen as as a positive for for uh, for from for the Russian leadership and therefore something that could be sustained for for the foreseeable future. Can you just hold off, Pavel, in answering, and we'll get the, another question from Robert Friedman. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, just to follow up, uh, Russia sells submarines and fast patrol boats to Vietnam, which strengthens Vietnam and its conflict with China over their exclusive economic zones. It sells tanks and other kinds of weapons to India, which strengthens India in its conflict with China. So my question is exactly what kind of strategic alliance is it if the Russians are in fact providing weapons and relatively sophisticated weapons to the enemies or in the case of Vietnam, the potential enemy of China? Great, thank you. And uh, there were a couple of other questions in the chat room, um, uh, some of which have been covered already uh, about natural resource flows of Russia and about money flows behind uh, and through these conflicts. Um, um, so I would ask, I'll now invite in turn the four um, panelists to respond both to the questions from the audience and to uh, Angela Stent's comments, maybe starting with uh, Irina. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Angela, for the comments and all the speakers for their uh, reports. It was very interesting and very stimulating. Well, uh, Angela, regarding your comments, uh, uh, I was trying to put only one thing regarding, I do not overestimate uh, the possibility, the future of, um, of uh, Antan Cordial between uh, the United States and, and the European Union, uh, knowing and uh, well assessing all the problems both partners have. Uh, my point was rather to say that, well, the Chinese factor of this, um, this concerns uh, uh, regarding China, they could make this partnership, this alliance uh, strong in spite of all the problems both partners have. Uh, so what will be the balance? It is very difficult to say now, but that is really what makes them to, to talk and to cooperate and to be still the partners. We don't know what will be in the States after 24. We don't know what will be in, in, uh, in Europe. Well, we didn't know about AUKUS, which really changes the, um, the context. So we'll see. Uh, now regarding this uh, China, Russian, nobody says in Russia, and I stressed it, uh, and in China, uh, both sides say they don't need alliance. Uh, yeah, they have the strategic partnership. And uh, this is due to a very simple fact that, well, that both partners have 
very different interests in many, many spheres. They do not come into confrontation, into public uh, confrontation, in particular, say, in the, in the Security Council, uh, well, they are rather reserved. Uh, but the, the differences of interest are everywhere, starting from Arctic and to, to Southern Africa, and it will be more and more of that. In the MENA region, in Afghanistan for now, well, everyone is um, in the state of alert. Uh, nobody wants to um, the situation to 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 burst, you know, into into. Uh, well, everyone wants Afghanistan to stay uh, uh, to stay uh, as a whole, uh, and. Uh, we don't know what will be the government. We don't know how they will behave. We don't know what will be the um, level of uh, um, of uh, terrorism. Uh, what will be their priority uh, to keep the country together and somehow uh, stable uh, with the support? Because there is no other way uh, but the support of the international community, humanitarian support, and uh, every or to earn this money uh, as the old edition of Talibs did uh, with, uh, with um, narcotics and, uh, and other things. So we all wait and wait and see. Uh, China and Russia are practically in the same situation, though Russia is more concerned because of its allies in, uh, and partners in the Central Asia. Uh, so we'll see it. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. And on now to uh, Alexander Iskandarian. I, I don't have a lot to... to uh to comment on, on Angela's comment on my paper and my uh, presentation, because mostly I approximately agree with all she said. Uh, yes, I think that already maybe we shouldn't uh, say about post-Soviet space, maybe it's better to, to call it post-post-Soviet space, because sometimes you cannot find a lot of common between, I don't know, Tajikistan and Estonia. Tajikistan looks more like Egypt than Estonia, more, more like Czech Republic than Tajikistan with Estonia have something uh, in common. So just thank you for, <clears throat> for your comment. I have a question or how to call it comment for, Dr. Burbanov, um, he said that uh, it is most common fallacies feeding this war into a framework of geopolitical talks. Uh, and, and instead of understanding the right of uh, Azerbaijan to defend itself. Um, this session is about geopolitics. Maybe uh, you need to have place to talk uh, about right of the state, but it's not about me. Uh, now you have different frameworks, you have security framework, you have a uh, humanitarian framework, you, you have conflict resolution framework, uh, uh, and sure you have geopolitical framework. This war was not in, in a box, it was not isolated uh, from the world. And uh, really I didn't talk about Karabakh war. Uh, what I talk about is a changing of world order, at least on the territory of what they call Eurasia, former Soviet uh, Union, and some places around. The, that war was just indicator of the process, which I think is more global than just South Caucasus or result of uh, this, this war. Thank you. Great, thanks. Yes, we, we do have a terminology problem that Eurasia is a loaded term and post-Soviet space is a loaded term. So what can we do? So over to uh, Elizabeth Wishnik. Uh, thank you for these questions and comments. I would say in response to uh, Robert Friedman, 
I would say that it's a global alignment, a global level alignment that uh, that where Russia and China share certain uh, norms about authoritarian governance and also certain interests in countering what they see as U.S. and Western pressure. But on the regional level, I agree with you, there are a lot of uh, frictions and they tend to agree to disagree on many points, such as the ones you mentioned. Of course, uh, Chinese experts uh, comment critically about these arms sales that you noted, um, but uh, Russia is also not so happy about China's Ukraine policy. Um, so just to refer to some uh, questions from the chat about resources and also the Indo-Pacific, I think Russia uses its resource sales uh, to diversify its partnerships in the Asia Pacific so that it's not so focused on uh, China and has more options in terms of partners because the Sino-Russian partnership is a limitation in, in the Asia Pacific region uh, for Russia. Um, I agree with Angela Stent that uh, that Russia is likely to try to increase its influence in Central Asia. Uh, I think Central Asia, like the Arctic, are areas where we may see the limits to the Sino-Russian partnership. Um, uh, it's an area where the U.S. Uh, and Russia may well cooperate, given the situation in Afghanistan, especially since the option for the U.S. to cooperate with China is not uh, very plausible. Um, and it's also a time when China's influence in the region seems not to have uh, grown as expected, either as a result of its vaccine diplomacy there or its Belt and Road Initiative. So I think this Central Asia is going to be a place to watch for Sino-Russian relations and U.S.-Russian relations in the future. Great. So now we have uh, two, two or three minutes remaining and uh, Pavel Baez can wrap up. Yes. From. Yes, it is very interesting question about to what degree of resources uh, is it could be a, an asset for Russian foreign policy to where there are profits going from the export of these resources, and certainly there are some freak moments like these couple of weeks when suddenly you can harvest colossal profits from exporting uh, natural gas, but the general trend. Uh, for Russia is that you know the energy transition is happening in the world. Uh, the resources Russia can export are becoming uh, less in demand. Uh, it's becoming a buyer's market. So your instrumentalization of this uh, asset uh, is generally declining. Uh, you know, in the, in the perspective of say 10, 15 years from now, when the nuclear submarines will come, uh, for instance, uh, online in Australia, uh, Russian energy power will probably be significantly less uh, less important. And th that perspective is gradually being internalized in the Kremlin. Where the profits go, yes, some oligarchs can make some profits. Novatek is, I think, doing generally all right in the Yamal LNG, but they are a lot indebted to China, they need to pay back a lot. And for kind of Russia in general, still the amount of profits and the amount of investments are generally in the, of two different orders. And I also think that in the Arctic, it's visible in particular, if you want to develop your resource base, and if you want to militarize at the same time, these two doesn't, we cannot come together. And the collapse of the Stockman project in the Barents Sea, I think is an illustration to that. If you want to test your nuclear propelled cruise missile in this area, international partners will find it hard to swallow. And I will stop here. I think it's exactly on our time. Uh, great. So I, I thanks to all of the uh, panelists for being so concise and the audience for packing in a lot of questions. And I'll hand the floor over to one of our Nachelniki uh, to um, explain what's happening over the break um, because I, I think we have 30 minutes to uh, to get lunch dinner breakfast whatever time sensitive meal you're uh, looking for Mar Marlene is there anything else I should say or um, I, I can just say yeah. I think uh, Marlene can correct me if I'm wrong uh, but basically yes we have 30 minutes so we'll reconvene again in half an hour um, and uh, just as a reminder, we have um, two sessions that'll be going on uh, simultaneously. 
Um, so um, if you are interested in uh, panel 3A on the program, which is Russian foreign and security policy, um, Elizabeth Wisnick will chair it. Um, that will be at this same link. Um, I'll be chairing uh, the other panel, uh, which will be on conflicts in the region. Um, and uh, just in, I'm going to just post the link in the chat right now, um, just to make every, sure everybody has it. But it should be, it's, it's uh, you can find the link also in, online and in the invitation as well at the, uh, at, the, at the bottom as the alternative link for this panel. So um, enjoy your uh, lunch slash dinner slash late night drink slash afternoon coffee, um, whatever your time zone, and uh, we'll look forward to reconvening soon. Hello, can you hear me? Hopefully, yes. Sorry, we have some logistical issues. We have the team of speaker arriving very soon. They are in the other room. Hello everyone, I'm Liz Wishnick, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce this session about, about Russian foreign and security policy. So we're going to go in the order of the program, and uh, we're going to begin with Irina Busigina from the 
Higher School of Economics in St. Petersburg. Uh -huh. So now you can hear me, right? And you can see me. Uh, hello, everyone. Very, very nice to be here. And uh, good evening from St. Petersburg. It's quite, quite late, but not that much now in St. Petersburg. Okay. And I immediately start uh, demonstrating my, my presentation. So it's here, right? So can you see it? Can you, can you see the presentation? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I, don't, I don't hear you. I see it. You see it, so, so I, can, I can start, right? Please. I see it as well. So you see it as well. So let's, let's, let's believe that the others also see it. So what I can tell you in my eight minutes, so the presentation will be about Russia and its two shared neighborhoods, right? And my, my first slide, how should I, uh-huh. Uh, right, so this will be what this is about geography. So what I want to concentrate on a certain geographies. So this is what we call Russia's shared neighborhood. This is generally the shared neighborhood embraces the regions which consist of two uh, larger powers and smaller, smaller regions or smaller nations between them. And uh, as, we, as we all know, Russia, thanks to its size and so on and so forth, has such two such shared neighbor neighborhood at once. And this will be the Western so-called neighborhood, namely Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova, Moldova which uh, Russian Federation shares with the, with the European Union, and the Eastern neighborhood, or better to say South Eastern neighborhood, where the, uh, the five Central, Central Asian countries is what the region that Russia shares with the People's Republic of China. Uh, right? What is important for me and what was important, you know, what was, what was the idea, why the idea of looking at two of these shared neighborhoods for the reason that, uh, what, what was the sense? The sense was that major powers must share, and this is, I stress it, the word share, the in-between spaces, that is to negotiate the, their, their relations with each other with regards to the smaller nations in between them in order to come to a balance if possible and negotiate the relationship. It means also that the major powers operate in the limited, op op uh, limited choice of the foreign policy, foreign policy options. Right. What are the premises for dealing with the, with the shared neighborhood? The first premise is that the leadership in, a, in Eurasia would be a priority for any, I stress it, any Russian foreign policy, foreign policy strategy. However, this is, this is the reality which we kind of said, uh, is that Russia cannot hold back or kind of yet to, to be free and can hold, cannot hold back the process of fragmentation or disintegration or, or and multi-vectorism of the smaller nations in the post-Soviet space. Therefore, Russia has to really share the neighborhood with, the, with China and the EU, trying to negotiate with them and establish a balance regarding smaller nations in between, be it formally or informally, all right? What are the Russian Russia's preferences? And this is this is the, the idea was of mine was to look to look at the same time and uh, to trying to compare the, the, the Russian preferences with regard to uh, to its so-called Western neighbor, uh, Western uh, neighbor, Western shared neighborhood and the South Eastern neighborhood uh, with China. And here the divergence of preferences. Uh, I would say uh, in the shared neighborhood, with Russia, with China, and with the EU is very telling. So what do we see? We see that uh, if we take first uh, Russia and China and Central Asia, we would see that China, Russia supports non-democratic incumbents to guarantee that they stay in power. And what is what is very important, and this is this is for me, this is so far this is critical that Russia shares with China the preference of maintaining democratic and non-democratic stability uh, non-democratic stability in central asia and what is also comes to the to the to the kind of to this basket is that china is generally indifferent to russia's treaty activism at least it doesn't oppose it since russia has uh, china has its own ambitious geoeconomic uh, project which uh, directly affects this uh, shared neighborhood with russia so by treaty activism i mean uh, in particular, the 
the uh, uh, Eurasian Economic Union, Russia, 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 Russia centric, centric economic attempt to economic uh, attempt to, uh, to to reintegrate the uh, Central Asian Central Asian countries around Russia and Russia being a driver of this thing, right? So with the EU and Russia shared neighborhood and what is really you you kind of this is when 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 you observe this two neighborhoods in kind of a parallel you really see the different the divergent things which kind of strictly separate the uh, Russia's preferences and efforts with regard to to uh, Central Asia and then from the from what is going on in Eastern Europe uh, Russia prefers non non democratization in the post of its space and the uh, limitation as much as possible the democratizing influence of these countries and of the European directly on the Russian territory. What is interesting is that Russia would possibly not openly object the development of economic relations between the countries which are in the shared neighborhood uh, and share shared neighborhoods and the uh, European Union member states. So theoretically, if the European Union could make a credible commitment that it would it would apply an approach that that would not encourage political reforms in these countries. Then the conflict, the conflictual relations would, would be probably resolved and a balance could be found. However, there is no mechanism of such commitment. So this is, and then uh, here I'm turning to my some conclusions and I will kind of try to summarize what I said previously that Russia's leadership generally is pr priority to limit the influence but this is but of, of other major powers, but this is unattainable, absolutely. So, and here we have, and here we have the, these, these two diverging parts. It is possible for Russia to informally separate spheres with this influence and maintain a balance with China, though the balance could be shifted in favor of China, but achieving such a balance regarding the shared neighborhoods with the EU and limiting the efforts of European actors to democratize the, these countries of the shared neighborhood is principally impossible. Thank you very much, and I stop here. I believe this is, was all my time for this. Elizabeth, this is correct, right? Thank you, Irina. Uh, that was an interesting concept of this, the shared neighborhood. And so now we're going to move on to a different neighborhood to look at Belarus, and we have Arkady Moses from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Greetings uh, to everybody from dark and uh, rainy Helsinki, but it's nevertheless very nice to join everybody and to be part of this conference. Uh, indeed, in our memo, my colleague Rihor Nizhnikov and I we analyze the dynamics of Russian-Belarusian relations since the Belarusian revolution that started in August last year. And we argued that, that contrary to uh, predictions, fears, that now that Lukashenko is so much more dependent on Moscow than he has ever been, uh, Moscow would be able to do in Belarus whatever it wants, and it would end up maybe even with the territorial incorporation of uh, Belarus into Russia, let alone all smaller things. We argue that this is not what is happening, that what is happening is actually almost business as usual. And we argue that for Russia, it's, it's a rational choice. It's quite easy to explain why Russia treads carefully and does not wish to radically change the status quo. But first, uh, let me just give you some facts why we think that it's business as usual. Obviously, everybody knows that Belarus has not been annexed or incorporated. Uh, Lukashenko has not recognized the annexation of Crimea, which some people thought he would. Uh, the military cooperation generally develops within the framework that uh, has been or was developed before the Belarusian Revolution of 2020. Yes, there is a new training center in, in the Western Belarus, but this is nothing new. Uh, maybe the scale slightly is, but the, the principle is the same. Russian troops have been using uh, military installations and objects on the territory of Belarus for training ever since, more or less. And Belarus has been and remains uh, Russia's closest military ally. 
the so-called 28 union programs. Uh, we haven't yet seen them published. They were signed recently, but we've only seen the summary. They don't look impressive. Uh, let me remind you, when the process of negotiating these documents started three years ago, they were called integration roadmaps. And the idea behind them was integration. What you're having now is harmonization of norms, not even unification of norms. And the list contains such important quote unquote documents as document on cooperation in the field of tourism. So basically what they had, they signed, but compared to the very basic fundamental document, the treaty signed in 99, uh, these new documents uh, are not particularly impressive. Importantly, I mean, there's very little increase of Russian influence in terms of party or, or domestic politics in Belarus. Pro-Russian parties were not allowed registration in Belarus. Uh, presidential hopeful Viktor Babarika, whom the analytical community was considering at least uh, not necessarily a totally pro-Russian candidate, but at least a candidate willing uh, to pragmatically cooperate with Russia was sentenced to a long prison term. And even more importantly, that Bill Gazprom Bank, a Russian bank was raided in Belarus. Basically the, the Belarusians took all the assets of that bank and appointed new leadership into the bank. And Moscow eventually had to acquiesce with that. The subsidies keep coming to uh, tranches of $500 million each were, were paid. And the third one, over $600 million has been promised. So basically, and what Lukashenko has to pay for that is uh, lip service. His visits to Moscow, I mean, he says, he nods, he says, yes, to everything that Putin says, but this is nothing uh, compared to the loss of sovereignty of, of, of his country. And there are three sets of arguments why we believe uh, this is very logical. And furthermore, this is the only logical outcome. First, for Moscow, Lukashenko remains, as he has been throughout decades, the best available partner. He might not be an ideal partner, but he's the best available one because A, he is able to keep the, the internal situation under control with relatively uh, little uh, involvement, direct involvement of Moscow needed, and B, for as long as he is in power, Belarus will not come closer to the West because it's, it would be against his worldview. Throughout his almost three decades in power, all his policy was actually aimed at increasing rather than decreasing the structural influence of Russia inside Belarus, starting from the transfer of the Belarusian gas transport infrastructure to, to the Russian companies to his education policy, which does anything but increase, uh, but, but foster the feeling of uh, independent statehood and sovereignty in the country. So he is the best available partner in general, and that's, that's a strategic choice for Moscow. Second set of argumentation is that the situation as it is, is instrumentally very useful for Moscow because uh, Lukashenko is happy to amplify the Russian message that uh, all the revolutions in the post-Soviet space are driven and inspired by the West. Uh, Lukashenko's repressions help uh, to kind of spread the word about potential negative consequences uh, for all potential protesters. I mean, this is not something that is discussed, but this is something when the example is obvious that people, people know uh, how problematic that would be for them now after they saw what happened to protesters in Belarus. Uh, for as long as Lukashenko is there, Moscow can tacitly, implicitly, or explicitly show its resolve to help its allies and the helplessness and the weakness of the West, because indeed the West cannot do much to change the behavior of this regime. And of course, for as long as Lukashenko is there with his policy, it's a drain on Western resources. Uh, not maybe strategically too important, but still something that needs to be noticed. And uh, it's, it's very useful. But the third set of reason is, and here I'm echoing some of the things which were, which were said before me during this conference, 
Moscow actually has a limited capacity. I mean, it's now challenged all over the post-Soviet space. In Central Asia, due to Afghanistan, situa situation in Afghanistan, but not only because the conflict between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, for example, is threatening to become a hot war, which are both are Moscow's allies. Uh, Nagorno Karabakh is a story where it's, it's now challenged. In Moldova, its allies lost elections. I'm not even, I don't even need to speak about Ukraine. So Belarus is the only territory where Moscow's influence is still strong. I don't know if it's increasing or decreasing, but even if it's increasing, it's, it's not uh, a very strong increase. But by trying to change the status quo, you might potentially undermine the stability and uh, make your own position on the wars. So this is more or less my argument in a nutshell. And what I want to finish with is that for these reasons, for the reasons that I've tried to indicate, uh, the West should not be worried that the current worsening of the Western re Belarusian relations, that the sanctions and uh, the lack of the, let's say, diplomatic dialogue between Belarus and uh, where the West would necessarily uh, push Lukashenko further and further into Russian embrace. He's been in that embrace for a long while. You cannot really significantly strengthen it. He's always no, no, known where Moscow's red lines are and he never wanted to step over them. So the, if, if the Western policy should actually be aimed at promoting the change inside Belarus, because only the change inside Belarus will eventually allow to weaken the structural dependency uh, of Belarus on Russia, which any investment into Lukashenko would never do. Thank you. Thank you, Arkady. Uh, now we're going to move on to uh, COVID-19 and, um, and Russia's so-called humanitarian assistance with Maria Om Omelicheva's presentation. She is a professor of national security strategy at the National War College of the National Defense University in Washington. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay, so I'm gonna uh, give it a try to share my presentation here. And I'm gonna switch gears slightly uh, because I thought that um, we can, you know, in addition to Russia using um, kinetic, non-kinetic gray zone and so on and so forth, instruments of uh, power, um, it kind of ventured into um, the soft power repertoire as well. So I was inspired to uh, conduct this research um, by something that happened to be in the limelight of international attention back in March of 2020, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic seems so long time ago. So if you may recall, in March 2020, Italy was among the first European country. Uh, parts of Italy were so heavily hit by COVID. And um, Vladimir Putin had a phone call with his Italian counterpart, uh, Giuseppe Conte, and he offered you know, pl plain loads of Russia's assistance, uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, medical equipment, pharmaceuticals, um, and um, bunch of military uh, doctors. And um, this is the operation that was dubbed from Russia with love, heavily criticized in the Western media. But following Italy, uh, Russia sent uh, aid to Serbia, to Venezuela, to almost 35 countries around the world, United States, even though um, the nature of that assistance is still uh, in dispute. So um, all of these gestures um, kind of raised some questions about what exactly the motivations of Russia in um, doing this. Did uh, motives matter and can um, on what Russia's broader foreign policy objectives are? So those are some of the things that motivated my um, research. All right, 
So Russia is not a newcomer to the world of humanitarian assistance. The, United, the, the Soviet Union before Russia um, invested lavishly, not only um, using humanitarian channels, but also official development assistance um, after the Second World War, uh, funding infrastructure projects in South Asia and in the Middle East. And as we know, after the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union, Russia kind of retrenched uh, from the humanitarian assistance field because it itself became the recipient of a, a humanitarian aid rather than being one of the donors. But then circumstances changed in um, starting in about 2000s, Russia was able to repay its debt and it re-entered um, this, this world of humanitarian assistance. And um, this graph demonstrates how uh, over the past decade in particular, Russia's overall official development assistance um, has gone up considerably. But um, that uh, line at the bottom of the ground show, at the, at the bottom of the graph shows that it's overall humanitarian assistance, however, constitutes a very, very small portion of its overall um, um, official development assistance. And it kind of stayed at the same level. So, um, between 2015 and 2020, humanitarian assistance accounted for about 2% of Russia's overall assistance and averaged about 0.002% uh, of Russia's GDP, which is, which is very, very little. And um, the main recipients of Russia's assistance, they vary from year to year. Um, in the past decade, it wasn't, uh, the recipients were not the former republics of the Soviet Union, Russia, ra rather Russia invested in Syria, North Korea and Palestine. <clears throat> and the uh, primary focus areas or sectors where Russia has uh, sent its assistance uh, have been education, food, and health sectors with the uh, World Health Organization um, and, um, and, and, and a handful of other UN agencies receiving the bulk of Russia's assistance. But um, given that I have very little time, let me fast forward to uh, where Russia sent its humanitarian aid. So overall, Russia sent aid to about 35 countries in 2020. And most of that aid, so this is not this graph does not show aid in absolute numbers. It shows relative um, to each other. So it's Serbia, China, Iran, Venezuela, Azerbaijan, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Moldova, Syria, and a handful of others. So these are um, some of the um, countries um, that became the recipients of Russia's aid. And so once you start looking into um, some of the correlations between where Russia send aid and what characterizes those countries, several patterns em emerge. So on the one hand, I, 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 I don't think it, it is possible to completely dismiss um, um, humanitarian factors because aid did go to countries which have been suffering from the rising death toll due to COVID-19. Uh, just by looking at the numbers uh, uh, during um, the, uh, uh, around the period when the aid was uh, received by those countries. And all of the aid went to countries um, that um, with the lower level of development and limited capacity to respond to the threat of um, the COVID-19 crisis. Having said that, some of the most interesting findings have to do with the fact that uh, Russia seems to continue uh, that tradition of aid for votes, um, re really uh, rewarding countries that support Russia in its uh, foreign policy priorities, um, the way the Soviet Union did. And the way I, uh, I, I kind of demonstrated it is by looking at um, who voted against a couple of um, United Nations General Assembly resolutions that condemned Russia's annexation of Crimea and the most recent one that condemned Russia's militarization of the Crimea. And there is not perfect, but very, very strong correlation between those countries that voted against those resolutions and those countries that received Russia's aid. And I, you know, I was listening to Arkady's um, presentation and I think it's also important to see which countries had an opportunity to vote, but they chose to abstain. So Belarus, for example, even though it did not vote against, it strategically abstained alongside a number of other countries. So once you add those abstainees who did have a ch chance to uh, take a position for or against, but they chose not to, you know, there's like the, the, the perfect correlation between the aid and um, those countries' votes. And several other interesting patterns um, that emerged include 
um, number one, you know, Russia uh, has been interested in expanding its sales to the African and um, East Asian countries because it, its um, arms sales industry has been hit by sanctions. So uh, what 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 comes very clear um, because many many African countries submitted requests to uh, Russia's foreign ministry for aid. And you know how did they make those choices? Well, there is a, again correlation between. Um, these new military cooperation partnerships or new deals uh, with regard to sales of weapon systems by Russia and countries receiving aid or overall countries that have already been uh, Russia's military uh, <clears throat> partners for a while, they also received um, aid from the Russian Federation. Uh, and a couple of others, uh, so COVID-19 aid has trailed Russia's oil and gas and transportation and other infrastructure investments. And interestingly, there is also a little bit of correlation between um, territories where Wagner or other uh, PMCs from Russia uh, implicated in human rights abuses. And some of them were actually delivering humanitarian aid as well. So I'm out of time, but I do want to conclude uh, with this. So on the one hand, Moscow barely scored any point uh, by presenting uh, itself as this responsible global power delivering humanitarian assistance to the much needed um, territories and countries, uh, especially at the time when America retrenched uh, from those places. But um, there have been a lot of obstacles. On the one hand, Russia got hit by COVID itself, so it kind of scaled down its operations. There were also lots of other political, more particularistic um, obstacles domestically to um, make inroads into those uh, territories and countries. But to me, the most kind of detrimental negative consequence of everything that's been done is that we already have this ongoing debate about whether or not humanitarian aid has become a tool of political and strategic influence because it's supposed to be impartial, neutral, and based on need. And uh, activities of countries like Russia and China, they further undermine kind of trust uh, and uh, trust in, in these ideas of uh, the aid being impartial, neutral, and need-based. Um, so the outcome is that this time-honored time principles of humanitarianism lose their legitimacy and original purpose. And on that, I will stop. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Maria. And now we are going to turn to our last speaker, uh, Dimitri Gornberg, who is a senior research scientist at CNA and an associate at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. And he's going to talk to us about Russia's foreign military basing. Um, so he's our last speaker. So I would ask uh, the audience to prepare any questions you might have. You can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand after the last speaker. So um, please, Dimitri, go ahead. Great, thank you, thank you Liz. And thanks to uh, everyone for uh, coming and uh, uh, Marlene and the crew at uh, GW for organizing. Uh, so I wanna talk a bit about uh, Russian military basing. Uh, you, you may recall back in December of last year, the news broke that uh, Russia had signed an agreement with Sudan to build a naval base on the Red Sea. And at the same time, the, there was also a lot of uh, information about uh, Russia refurbishing the Tartus naval base in Syria. And there were rumors of other bases abroad uh, being negotiated in various, uh, various parts of the world. So Russia really kind of seemed to be on a spree of expanding its military uh, footprint abroad. Uh, but I'm going to argue that there's much less to this effort uh, than appears at first glance. The first, the vast majority of Russia's foreign bases are in neighboring uh, former Soviet states, uh, maintained either as legacy Soviet bases or as part of an ongoing effort by Russia to uh, retain its influence in the near abroad. And then, uh, despite various rumors uh, to the contrary, Farther afield, Russia mostly prefers to negotiate access to foreign ports and airfields rather than developing and maintaining its own bases. So let me just start uh, by kind of going through what uh, Russia's military uh, presence uh, abroad uh, is like. So if you compare Russia to its main competitor, Russia does not have very, uh, very many military bases abroad. The United States 
has over 700 military facilities outside its borders, uh, while Russia has less than 20. So, uh, and, and Russia's facilities can be divided pretty cleanly into three types, the legacy Soviet facilities, new facilities in the former Soviet states, and then the facilities being used for Russian military operations uh, in the Middle East uh, and North Africa. So um, this um, larger set include the, the largest set uh, includes some of these legacy facilities left over from the Soviet period, such as the military base in Tajikistan, a couple of bases in Armenia. Uh, and there's also the continuous uh, Russian presence in Transnistria uh, that's been justified as, as needed for its uh, peacekeeping operations in the region. Uh, Russia has also established several military bases uh, more recently, but with it, within kind of the, the uh, post-Soviet, you know, the former Soviet uh, republics as part of its effort to ensure continued Russian influence in those neighboring states. So there's the, uh, uh, in 2003, Russia and Kyrgyzstan signed an, signed an agreement uh, to base Russian Air Force units at Kant, uh, and that's, uh, there's a long-term lease on that, so it's going to be the lease through 2027 and probably it will be renewed at that point. Uh, after the conclusion of the 2008 uh, Russia-Georgia war, Russia opened bases in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, and those facilities absorbed and superseded some previously existing peacekeeping operations in the region. And then most recently, in 2020, uh, Russia deployed peacekeeping forces to Nagorno-Karabakh, as part of the ceasefire agreement that ended uh, the most recent Armenia-Azerbaijan war. Uh, and then the third category of, uh, and the one that's maybe gotten the most press recently is the Russia's expanding footprint in the Middle East and North Africa. So uh, since the start of its inter in, uh, intervention in Syria in 2015, Russia's established uh, a number of facilities in Syria, most notably expanding the naval facility in Tartus. And then there's also uh, the Khmeimian air base there's a couple of smaller air bases that host Russian aircraft and, uh, and support personnel uh, in Syria as well. There's also uh, an unofficial base that Russia has at Al Jufra in Libya, where it's been stationing aircraft that have been used to provide air support for uh, the Libyan National Army. Uh, and Wagner Group has been using that base as well as a transport and staging area for its combat and support operations abroad. Uh, let me uh, talk very briefly about the military expansion abroad, which, I, as, I, as I mentioned, is pretty limited in nature, um, uh, when, at least when compared to the United States, but then pretty extensive if you compare it to, say, China. So it's, it's all a matter of perspective. Uh, now, there are rumors that agreements have been reached to transform existing training and assistance relationships with several African states into permanent bases. Uh, the six countries that have been mentioned in these rumors include the Central African Republic, Egypt, Eritrea, Madagascar, Mozambique, and Sudan. Now, of these, Sudan uh, is the most sort of advanced. Uh, it confirmed an agreement to allow Russia to establish a naval base on the Red Sea. Uh, and then Russian officials have confirmed that there's an agreement to establish a logistics center in Eritrea. Uh, Russia is known to be seeking a base in Egypt, but no agreement has been reached. And it, it could be argued that the decision to go with Sudan may be a sign that Russian leaders recognize that a base in Egypt isn't actually in the cards. But the other three are just rumors at this point. So no, no official confirmation from either side. And then there's Latin America, where uh, there have been rumors that Russia was planning to establish a military base in Venezuela. These were explicitly denied back in 2019 by President Putin. And he had earlier denied similar rumors that Russia would return to the old Soviet base in Cuba. So, so what do these patterns of base placement in recent years say about Russia's overall strategy for use of force abroad? So first of all, uh, supporting expeditionary operations abroad is kind of a secondary goal for Russia. Uh, it's, it has set up several, uh, several bases to support its operations in Syria and Libya. Uh, but it's done little to establish a, a, a range of, or a kind of a network of air and land bases elsewhere in the world. Instead, it's preferred to work with host countries to send trainers and receive landing rights in areas where it's seeking to expand, expand its influence, such as parts of Africa and Latin America. So in other words, access is preferred over bases because permanent bases require much greater investment and because they carry risks related to um, appropriating the security challenges uh, that are presented uh, by the host states. 
Uh, the one exception to this general tendency to avoid establishing uh, bases abroad is in the naval sphere. Because of the nature of naval operations and their needs for repair and resupply, Russia and then the Soviet Union before it has long sought to ensure port access uh, globally. So in high priority areas uh, where the Russian Navy patrols regularly, such as the Mediterranean, this is considered insufficient. Actual bases are required to ensure ability to maintain and resupply the Mediterranean squadron. But this goal is geographically limited. Uh, in locales farther afield, such as Southeast Asia and Latin America, Russian military, the Russian military considers port access agreements sufficient for its uh, logistics requirements. So uh, overall, uh, recent patterns in military base construction highlight that Russia's primary focus remains protecting its own territory rather than overseas expansion. It's invested most heavily in building new bases near vulnerable areas on, uh, on its own territory, both near Ukraine and in the Arctic. And it's is, you also used existing and newly established bases in neighboring states to maintain a de facto buffer zone uh, around its own territory. Uh, so Russia uh, Russia's also sought to increase its military footprint in Belarus, uh, though, as Arkady has just uh, discussed, that country's leadership has so far successfully resisted any pressure to establish uh, any permanent Russian facilities on its territory beyond, beyond the existing radar station. So let me just conclude very quickly with some implications for US policy. Uh, uh, both Russia and the US uh, use military bases abroad as forms of political influence, but whereas the US seeks a global presence, uh, as clearly indicated by the global nature of its military footprint, Russia has fewer resources and must therefore pick and choose where to invest. Uh, Russia's basing posture thus clearly indicates that its defense priorities are primarily focused on its immediate environs, uh, especially the former Soviet states, plus the Eastern Med. And so US planners should be less concerned uh, about the possibility of further Russian adventures in far off foreign locales, such as African Latin America, and more focused on the regions where Russia is building up its military infrastructure, such as our, the Arctic and the Middle East. Thanks, I'll stop there. Thank you, Dimitri, and thank you to all the speakers for keeping so, so closely to the time. We've just heard uh, four different perspectives on how uh, Russia acts in its uh, near and far uh, neighborhoods. And to help us make sense out of all of this, we have William Hill, Global Fellow at the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute and a former Professor of National Security Strategy at the National War College. And following uh, William Hill, we will um, move over to the general Q&A. So do think about any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to thank the Ponars organizers for asking me to serve as a discussant on this panel, both the general subject of the panel and the focus of the papers are of particular interest to me. Uh, there are a great many interesting points and thought provoking ideas in these uh, four fine papers. But I'll attempt to concentrate on some aspects of each one of them, which I think suggests some general conclusions or inferences about the current state of overall Russian foreign and security policy. Um, and I'm going to be try to be a, a bit provocative, so might ask forgiveness in advance if I uh, gloss over some of the uh, details and qualifications that, that uh, might be involved in the arguments. Um, uh, Professor Busigina's paper uh, employs the concept of shared neighborhoods to analyze Russian foreign policy in Central Asia and Eastern Europe, um, in particular Belarus, Ukraine, and Moldova, and to explain the differences between Russia's relations with China and those with the EU. Um, and she asserts in this that in these former Soviet republics, former Soviet states, uh, Russia has sought uh, and perhaps still seeks to uh, exert dominant influence. Uh, this is something that, that an observation uh, which certainly accords with my experience as a practitioner uh, in the region. Um, you know, however, as she notes, as China's has increased its presence in Central Asia and the EU more active in Eastern Europe, um, an increasingly asymmetrical relationship with China has not provoked conflict with Moscow, while the common neighborhood with the EU is, in her words in the paper, a battlefield. 
Uh, and the argument goes, the difference is the ch challenge from a an authoritarian China is largely economic, while the EU's promotion of democracy is seen by Moscow as a threat, not just to its influence in the region, but to Russia itself, um, as reflected in the most recent Russian national security strategy. And indeed, having read that strategy, I, I was struck to, to the degree to which um, which I thought was something new in the strategy that, that Russia focuses on, on threats to domestic stability and domestic system. Um, this basic line of argument, I think, begs for further elaboration and discussion, but I think it captures a basic feature of Russia's current policy. Um, although a number of questions arise, even if one accepts the basic premise, for example, um, in the, the paper, uh, she quotes Putin uh, that, that uh, that Putin wants Russia to become a leader and center of gravity for the whole of Eurasia. I mean, why is that? Why, the other aims ascribed to current Russian leadership seem perfectly reasonable to heads or, or governors of governments of, of states, but uh, why the, the, the push uh, for such preeminence? Um, uh, are Putin and Moscow's motives mainly to make the region and Eastern Europe safe for Russian uh, authoritarianism? Uh, this might seem clearly to be a part of current Russian policy, I agree. Um, but I wonder what else there might be driving Russian policy and how long Moscow can maintain such an effort to defend its immediate Western neighbors uh, from such hostile influences, such as the EU. I also wonder about what I see as an assumption that the current Russia-China relationship can be maintained uh, as long as both are authoritarian. Is there nothing else, such as possible security competition or incompatibility in Central and South Asia, that could upset uh, the Moscow-Beijing relationship? Um, in their essay, um, Dr. Moshes and Dr. Nishnikow present a detailed examination of relations between Russia and Belarus, where the fallout from the August 2020 protests has produced another particularly acute collision between Russia and the West, uh, that is the EU and the West. The, the gist of the argument is that contrary to a lot of the hyperbole from Western capitals, Russia is not likely to push for much greater integration or incorporation of Belarus into the Russian Federation than they have uh, right now, but rather a more rational policy uh, of or, or realistic policy of defending the status quo. Uh, I find their narrative convincing, especially uh, that on page four in the paper following the, the one team subhead in showing how maintaining Lukashenko in power, despite his occasional demonstrable exercises of autonomy from Moscow, is ultimately an approach which is most in Moscow's interests, both in terms of foreign and domestic policy. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. First, I wonder, and uh, Arkady, you answered this somewhat in your oral remarks. I, I, I wondered when reading the paper uh, how much uh, or whether the, the September 9th Putin-Lukashenko meeting and the just concluding Zappa exercises added or altered anything to your analysis. Uh, since I assumed that the piece was drafted before both of these events. Second, I, I would love to see a more detailed discussion or, or elaboration of current and foreseeable factors uh, which make more or, let more or less likely the scenarios offered in the final paragraph of the paper, whether there are Western or Russian policies which might make one uh, or another of these scenarios more likely, and which might be most desirable from the point of view of external, in particular, Western actors. Uh, now, Professor Omelicheva's uh, paper presents some very interesting facets of, and observations on Russian vaccine diplomacy and, and foreign aid in general. In the process, uh, she makes a number of broader observations on the geopolitical aspects of Russia's approach uh, to humanitarian and foreign assistance. Now, the idea that foreign assistance in general from any state and Russian in particular serves geopolitical aims is not new, but a number of the examples in the paper illustrate how this observation holds in Russia's case. Um, uh, table one in the paper illustrating the coincidence of aid recipients and support for Moscow in the 2014 and 2019 UN votes on Crimea, Crimea 
uh, strikingly support the assertion of the importance of non-humanitarian factors in the Russian approach. Um, by the way, looking at this chart, I wonder why, how Nicaragua didn't deserve aid from Russia after being so lo loyal uh, in support, at least according to the charts. Uh, my main criticism is more of a wish, and I got some of this in the oral remarks, but I think you know, if the paper expands, it'd be worth putting in. Uh, a wish that in addition to the figures and table in the paper already, I would have liked to see a bit more data on the military cooperation deals, the energy, transportation, and mineral extraction contracts, and other things mentioned on page four near the end of the narrative just before the conclusion, and, and how these coordinate uh, or, or correlate with Russian assistance. Uh, nonetheless, the narrative in the paper and the examples presented certainly lead convincingly to a conclusion that Moscow has taken a quote, taken advantage of the humanitarian cause to advance its military cooperation, create new economic ties, and gain geopolitical support, unquote. Uh, now, Dr. Gernberg uh, provides a succinct, direct examination of where Russia is currently placing its military base, bases, uh, a study that's especially welcome in light of some of the alarmist hoopla that one sees uh, from some quarters of the press and think tank world on the threat posed by increasing Russian presences around the globe. Uh, the paper and, and the remarks in, that he's given uh, provide a, a good brief review of where the Soviet Union had bases, which ones Russia kept after the Soviet collapse, and what new bases Russia has established since the turn of the century. The bad news for the alarmists seems to be that much of Russia's attention and resources are focused on the border area with Ukraine and the Arctic and pose relatively circumscribed threats in regional rather than global contexts. Uh, I think it's understandable, as uh, the paper argues, uh, that naval bases in the Mediterranean uh, may be a special or a different case in that maritime presence has different requirements and different implications from uh, boots on the ground. Um, I would welcome getting a bit more detail on what the actual Russian aims and presences are in Africa and, and whether what he now characterizes, you know, Dima characterizes rumors might at some point uh, turn into reports or developments with, with more substance. Is this likely or, or is, is this really unlikely? And if some are likely, which ones are they? Uh, in the end, I find myself very much in agreement with the conclusion, one that Russia is more interested in and devoting far more resources to areas close to home. And two, that it is namely these areas, such as the Middle East and the Arctic, where the Russian presence and activity should be of greatest concern to US policymakers. Um, at the outset of my remarks, I said I would be looking for common elements in these papers. And here are some of those which the inferences or, or elements that, that, that I draw from looking at all of these papers together. You know, first of all, Russian foreign and security policy uh, seems by far most concerned and sets the highest priority on relations with its immediate neighbors, in particular those states that were once part of the Soviet Union. Uh, second, if there is an ideological or normative element to Russian foreign policy, it is not to spread a political ideology to other countries or regions, but to defend the domestic authoritarian system that has grown up in Russia over the past two decades. Third, absent a perceived threat to its domestic system, Russian foreign and security policy can be fairly flexible and pragmatic, depending upon how Moscow assesses its interests. But four, this suggests to me that a great deal of Moscow's alleged disruptive behavior may be largely defensive and reactive rather than actively promoting an alternative international system or order. Uh, I hope these remarks and these conclusions may add food for thought to uh, discussion of these four very fine papers. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for, for uh, bringing all of these papers together and providing such interesting insights. Uh, so 
Now it's uh, the turn of the audience to contribute to this discussion. Um, I'm sure the panelists would like to respond to the many interesting questions posed by the discussant, uh, but we will uh, see if the audience has any uh, questions. Um, I had one in the chat and then, and then uh, one uh, by Irina Musigina. So I'll first go to the question in the chat. Uh, which was to Dmitry by uh, Mikhail Filipov. And he asks about uh, Russia largely building bases near uh, vulnerable, vulnerable areas of its own territory. And the questioner asks, uh, vulnerable to, to uh, which country or parties, to NATO, to Ukraine, to China? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh... Uh, thanks, Mikhail. Um, NATO primarily. Uh, I don't. Th I think what we've we've seen is that Russia does not currently see China as a threat, and realistically, uh, I mean Russia Russia sees Ukraine as a threat, but only to territories that Russia has <laughs> annexed, uh, you know, illegally from uh, from Ukraine, uh, not to uh, its uh, you know homeland. Uh, uh, you know the territory it had prior to, to 2014. Um, it does. It has built a bunch of uh, new bases on Ukraine's borders, but that's uh, you know as, as in a way it's a it's a way to deter Ukraine from trying to uh, recapture uh, DNR LNR territory, for example, um, uh, on their own through military means. So so it's. Uh, you know there there are a lot of uh, new bases on on uh, Russian bases on Ukraine uh, on the border with Ukraine. Um, uh, so it depends on you know uh, how you think what you think of uh, protect what, what you think of Russia's territory and and what what you think of it as as protection. Those those terms can uh, uh, in in the case of Ukraine get get a little dicey. But mostly it's NATO. Uh, and Liz, just uh, we're gonna we're gonna address uh, Bill's remarks later. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I just want to take a few from the audience, and then each speaker will have a few minutes to, to address Bill's comments. Uh, so, uh, Irina, please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. I have a question to Maria Omelichva. Uh, Maria, thank you very much for, for this uh, very interesting thing of COVID assistance on Russia. And uh, my, 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 my question is, what was Russian approach, basically? Did Russia uh, did Russia act on demand? So a country say, say, save me, give me, I don't know what, or money, so the, the, the assistance, or Russia propo proposed itself the, the, the assistance to a certain, to a certain countries. And then uh, was it something, you know, puzzling? Because I think, I think it's a very interesting, for instance, puzzling, like uh, when uh, a country was asking an assistance from Russia and Russia said no. Were there the, case, the cases like this? Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. May I, may I Elizabeth? <laughs> okay. So indeed, um, I will use the, um, an example of African countries, uh, which was all over Russia's news. So apparently, like over a dozen of countries submitted requests for humanitarian assistance. Um, and then there was a speaker from Russia's uh, foreign ministry um, who said that we're going to review and decide where we're going to send aid. So like in, in the literature on aid, um, there are two separate decisions that are made. One is who deserves aid and then second decision is how much aid is being said and I, I think the two needs to be analyzed i kind of put them together just for the sake of the presentation um but so with regard to whether or not someone asked a lot of aid was sent based on request but um there were also countries that russia offered aid um uh, itself, you know, obviously Serbia, like Italy and, and whatnot. So, or it could be just on the sidelines of some of the meetings um, that, that uh, the aid came up and then Russia followed through. But there were countries, uh, particularly in Africa, that asked aid and never received that. So. <laughs> may, may I ask you, Maria, why Italy? Is it not a developing country, obviously, uh, or a supporter at the UN? Yeah, I mean, there was a, that, that, that it, so I, um, so this, 
project is a part of a much broader project and you know um thanks dr hill because i i do look much deeper into all of the other ties and i compare it to what china did what the united states did because the case of italy is really really interesting because it, exa it exemplifies the geopolitics of humanitarian assistance because before russia china came you know, China provided a bunch of aid to Italy. Then Russia came and the United States provided a lot of aid, but it never really engaged in this PR uh, showing um, all, all, all of that help um, it, it brought to uh, COVID stricken country. And I, I know, I, and I have hypothesis as to why United States kind of kept it, um, you know, not advertised too much uh, because it's been the number one donor of humanitarian assistance globally. But Russia and China, obviously, they you know spun their PR machine and Italy in particular because it goes along with the narrative that you know it came on the backdrop of European Union trying to figure out um, you know all of the you know rules logistics of providing assistance uh, in terms of uh, PPE or tests and whatnot. And you know anyone who knows about European bureaucracy, it just takes forever and ever. The same happened with vaccine because I could have used an example with vaccine because Italy ran out of patients and in the end it signed a, a one of the first countries that signed contract for sputnik with russia uh and and kind of you can draw parallels that as frustration desperation and then russia plays on uh kind of ineptness of the european union that it spins as well they just uh stand for themselves so that they just plays up to you know america's tune they're just the pawn in um you know america's uh, games of geopolitics and really present Russia kind of that last <laughs> uh, bastion of again, you know, Christian values and solidarity and whatnot. So it's, it's definitely a lot of PR that went into that from Russia with love um, situation. That's, that's very interesting. China also gave aid to Italy and then they doctored videos of Italians singing the Italian national anthem on their balconies to show them singing the Chinese national anthem. Uh, so <laughs> the, it'd be interesting to look at Russian disinformation about humanitarian assistance as well. Um, and next we have Mikhail in front of a beautiful background, which I imagine is some surfing spot uh, nearby. Hi, yes, it, it's my, my favorite surf spot, a few blocks from my place in San Diego. Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, the um, I have one question first to Arkady, and um, I know uh, you focused on status quo, sort of staying, perhaps not being alarmist, but don't you see perhaps that the status quo and the increased dependency politically on Putin for Lukashenko? implicitly opens an easier passage for Russia to project military power into Belarus and particularly with respect to Ukraine, uh, positioning faster forces there and, and stretching or overstretching Ukraine defenses if need be, or if the opportunity arises. So even though, you know, it seems to be kind of status quo, it potentially poses more alarm. And the second one to Dmitry on the defensive perimeter being the primary focus. Uh, but if you look at the area denial strategy, which is a big part of, of, of these Russian kind of buildups and including Crimea, what about, do, do, don't you see, is, is, is there a way to distinguish kind of offensive from defensive intentions there, right? Because the same military bases that are ostensibly built to protect from external threat can be springboards for further advance. So, thanks. Uh, so, uh, please go ahead, Arkady, and then Dimitri. Yes. Uh, I will. So, I need to reply to Mikhail's question, right? And then keep. Okay. Uh, no, I, I, I mean, theoretically, of course, an argument can be easily built as, as you've just done it. And the Ukrainian, Ukrainian military and Ukrainian security community uh, should take this possibility into, into account, but I don't think it's very probable because uh, although it would look good on paper, it would not necessarily look uh, as, as threatening in, in reality. Um, inside Russia, the issue of 
potential deployment of troops in Belarus will not necessarily be popular. Uh, inside Belarus, it will not necessarily be popular probably to the country. If, 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 if it happened now, it could probably provoke more protests now. So you would have more of a domestic problem. But even if it happened, I mean, in reality, uh, an, an Air Force base somewhere in Southern Belarus or two bases even might make sense but deployment of, of ground troops would make no sense because of the Palacia swamps. I mean, this territory is not easily, easily penetrable for any, any ground troops. And uh, that would all only make sense in the context of preparation of a really big Russian-Ukrainian war uh, where everybody would need to forget about plausible denial and, and all that and Russia's role in the conflict in the east of Ukraine. So. I, I cannot 100% rule that out. That's why I, I'm saying that people should follow the developments attentively, but I myself don't think it's, it's, it's very realistic. Okay, Dimitri. Yep. Uh, thanks, uh, Misha. It's a very good and important question. Uh, my main goal here was uh, to focus on, uh, you know, to, to highlight that Russia is focusing on its its neighborhood rather than areas farther afield. So I take your point about, you know, when we're talking about its neighborhood, is it defensive, is it offensive? That's, I mean, that can be distinguished uh, at times, uh, depending on what kinds of um, weaponry and equipment is placed in, in you know, certain bases. So, uh, but it's a separate conversation. My, uh, so, so, and there are certainly, you know, some of the bases that are, um, uh, like, for example, near Ukraine, that could easily be used for, you know, offensive operations in, into Ukraine. Uh, so, but that's not, that, that was not my main focus here. My main focus was really to highlight that a lot of the speculation about uh, Russia's expanding global footprint in Africa, Latin America, and so forth, uh, there's, there's less to it than, than, than uh, seems... Uh, you know, apparent, uh, you know, if you follow all the kind of media reporting. Okay, thank you. So now I'd like to give the panelists a chance to respond to William Hill's interesting comments and to make any final conclusions uh, that they may have. So let's begin in the order uh, listed with Irina. Uh, two minutes for about two minutes for everybody. Mm, thank you very much, Elizabeth. I think I will, I will probably I need even less than two minutes. Uh, although, thank you very much, William. Uh, this was food for thought indeed. Uh, thank you. And yes, I will elaborate the problem. I, I have kind of a kind of a topic, which is exactly, it's not that I want to excuse, but still this is exactly, this topic is very difficult to kind of, to put into eight minutes. But I know I know that everyone could, could, say, could say something like this. So uh, now, but what I wanted, uh, what I would like to say and how to answer, you know, for me, what I was thinking, the political time, runs very diff differently for Russia with regards to these two neighborhoods. Since with, the, uh, with the, 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 the China in the Central Asia, the, uh, the kind of the uh, informal, if you want, if for informal status quo is almost there, you know, because sure, sure, the question of asymmetry, you know, will be some, at a certain point it will be, since the balance will be shifted in favor of China and necessarily not with Russia. However, Russia avoids, this is no, in Russian discourse, this asymmetry problem of with China and this growing asymmetry would never be mentioned. You know, they, they just don't, don't, don't kind of touch upon this topic since it, it is evident and it's not in Russian, in Russian favor, if you want, yeah? How can you present it? You know, so this is, we are partners, we are partners. Yeah, okay, what kind of partners? But still, and uh, this is, this is, but this is very different. So this, is, this can weigh in a way, you know, how, how long we don't know, but it cannot wait with the other, uh, with the other common neighborhood, na namely with this one, with the, that uh, Russia shares with the European Union. And by the way, if we say Central Asia, here we cannot say kind of Western neighborhood in a way, because these are, these are very different countries. So this is absolutely the, 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 the degree of uh, diversity of the di diversification, diverse of this, of these spaces is very different. You know, how, however, this is uh, for Russia, uh, the question of William was how long, how long can Russia keep this influence uh, 
you know, in, the, in, in this Western, Western kind of oriented or, or close to, to, to the European Union communities. However, for me, Russia, in Russian perceptions, Russia, in Russia's sense, the hope is still there. Since if you would look at these three countries, you would see that the, uh, the fate of Ukraine is not determined in Russian eyes. Absolutely not. So the, the final battle is not, is not kind of uh, lost by, by, by Russia. And if you would look at Moldova, this is the significant component, the significant element of pro-Russian is still there. And this, is, and this split, it is, it is one of the, 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 the critical splits in the society. And if you would take Belarus, then you then we turn, we turn to Arkady and said that, 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 that they say that, that the Lukashenko's, Lukashenko's Belarus is with Russia. So, but I mean, this is, this is, this is a very, very complicated picture, but this is what, what, what I can answer. Thank you very much again, William. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Irina. And now we turn to Arkady. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much, William, for your comments. And, uh, and the questions, the first question, whether the recent events like one more summit between Putin and Lukashenko and the West 21 exercises changed anything. In our analysis, the answer is no. Uh, first of all, we knew that the summit was coming as we now know that one more is coming in November. I mean, these summits do not radically change anything. The West 21 exercises were uh, an interesting thing, but if we compare it with many other exercises that Russia is, 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 is arranging with or without other allies, or even more interestingly, if we compare it with the West 2017 exercises, we will see that this was not the biggest and not the one that would attract most attention and most cause most hype. This time it was a routine thing Russia was basically exercising what it would exercise with or without Belarus. Belarus was just, uh, you know, a vignette. It was not a core thing uh, in, in, all, in all this context. As for policies, I think I would concentrate on the scenario of geopolitical revolution. I think it's, it's not necessarily highly likely, but it's quite possible that it's coming and then the next Belarusian revolution will be geopolitical. And the West should be prepared for that. And the West should be prepared to support uh, the forces uh, that will come, come up uh, protesting and, and fighting for their future under the slogans of the European future of Belarus. Unfortunately, in 2020, this was exactly not the case. The West and the EU in particular were so happy that the protesters did not want to make their revolution geopolitical, that they did not want to antagonize Russia that they were so they were basically happy to send signals that they are quite okay to see belarus in russia's sphere of influence they were quite okay to talk to putin and ask him to pass messages to lukashenko they were quite okay uh not to put any pressure on the regime lukashenko himself was not under the sanctions until november and basically if he he hadn't decided to to hijack a plane in may probably by now in European Belarusian relations, we would have already had uh, some kind of creepy normalization, unfortunately. Uh, so there, there was no appetite in Europe whatsoever to go into clashes with Russia over Belarus following the Ukrainian scenario. This was a wrong approach. It cost, it cost even human lives, I would say. Uh, and that should change. And that should be that the message that if Belarus becomes more democratic, freer, more liberal, and economically uh, prosperous. It should have a, 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 a European future. This message, this signal should be sent. Unfortunately, it hasn't been so far. Thank you, Arkady. And now we turn to Maria. All right, thank you. I'll be very brief. And I will only take on that question about Nicaragua, which is a very interesting one, because um, indeed, Russia had uh, backed both uh, Nicaragua and Venezuela um, very, very actively. And, um, and so I have a couple of hypotheses. One, it, it is actually quite informative about what other countries, uh, how other countries report COVID um, death. And a situation in Nicaragua was very interesting because it had very low, very slow onset of COVID until about May of 2020. And then COVID uh, infections went up until June and then they rapidly went down. And so in the last six months of the year, Nicaragua was reporting like, oh, 
we are, we are done with COVID. So uh, I mean, um, I mean, I if I were Russian government, I'm looking at Nicaragua. We already have good relationships, and you know, COVID infections go down. No need, no no help needed, right? Um, but on the other hand, there is another hypothesis that I um, have, which is when Russia was distributing its aid, it was already eyeing potential partners for its um, uh, Sputnik vaccine that was already in the making. And I think, um, you know, so Nicaragua is actually one of one of the um, importers of Russia's vaccine. And um, so it's not for free, but it's sold at kind of discounted rate uh, and it's a competitor to uh, the Western vaccines. So I think Russia was trying to also um, identify partners who would be in the capacity to partner up for purchasing or um, buying the copyright and producing a, a Sputnik vaccine at home in those countries. So Nicaragua became one of those states. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Now the last word uh, to Dimitri. Hey, thanks. Uh, so Bill asked a very interesting question about uh, uh, Africa and the likelihood of uh, further developments you know, with uh, Russian um, involvement in Africa. Um, as I indicated, I don't think I, th the, uh, I don't think bases uh, are likely as uh, as as a means of uh, of Russian involvement in Africa. I think Russia will continue to be involved there. And some of the reasons uh, for its the aims of its presence uh, include uh, uh, both both kind of expanding influence, but also profit motives. Right? There's there's a fair amount of uh, economic uh, gain, especially you know not maybe not so much for the Russian state, but for individuals in uh, uh, in the Russian leadership who are um, uh, who have uh, some influence in. And decision making, so so that that is the uh, the way the, the that is those are the aims, but the ways in which it's being done is more through uh, through training, even on the military side, training, uh, sending uh, PMCs uh, secure for security provision and that sort of thing, rather than you know having a, a Russian military facility that would then need to be protected and invested in and so forth. And we're in fact, even the ones that are uh, the furthest along like Sudan, we've seen some sort of backtracking where the Sudanese government's now so it's reviewing the base. So it's unclear whether, uh, whether it's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen. So there is, I think uh, the, the, the basing is, is not the way that Russia is going to pursue its influence strategy in places like in far, places farther afield like uh, Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia and so forth. I'll stop there. Well, I'd like to thank all of the panelists and, and our discussant for very interesting and informative presentations and also to Ponars for uh, keeping this community going uh, despite all of the odds. Um, now I believe we have a break uh, in the preceding 15 minutes uh, for tea, coffee, cocktails, midnight snack, wherever you are. And the proceedings resume in this same Zoom room, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if the organizers have something to. Oh, that's perfect, Liz. Thank you so much. And we meet in 15 minutes at that Zoom link. Thank you all. <laughs>